Ephesians 5, 21 to 33. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its saviour. Now as the church submits to Christ, also should wives submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are all members of his body. Therefore a man should leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound and I'm saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let the wife see that she respects her husband And when I think about growing up, I think about professional wrestling. I think about on a Sunday afternoon, sitting down with my lunch and watching WrestleMania or the Royal Rumble or some form of professional wrestling where people are jumping off the top ropes and holding each other down for counts of three. We would then go and try and dress up as our heroes. You know, you could dress up as Hulk Hogan by putting on a, an old yellow t-shirt that you could tear off and a red headband around your head. You could dress up as the ultimate warrior by getting some strips of cloth and tying it around your arms and then running around like a wild man. You know, but we moved on from there to something a little bit more generic and maybe something a little bit more applicable and more widely um, accepted. And that was dressing up as superheroes. In particular, I love dressing up as Superman. Superman, my mum, is a, she's a great um, sewer and so she sewed up this beautiful long red cape for me, but she made me a cape. Also, she made a cape for my little plush dog and so he got a little cape as well and we were the superhero duo. My dog and me, we both had capes and there was something about putting that cape on. There was something about putting it around my, um, the top of my shoulders and tying it up. It kind of imbued me with, with special powers. You felt more powerful. Powerful. You felt strong. You felt like you could do anything. And no, I did not, before you ask, I did not jump off the top of our roof and hurt myself um, irreversibly or anything like that. But it did make me feel powerful. Today's message is entitled Playing Dress Ups. Playing Dress Ups. Because when it comes to the, our most intimate relationships, when it comes to our most intimate um, relationships that are in our world, the health of those relationships tell us a lot about the story that we find ourselves in. So we can tell the story that you're living in by the health of your most intimate relationships. I'll say it another way. The other way around is if your relationships are struggling, it might be that you have too low a view of what's going on inside of your most intimate relationships. If you see your most intimate relationships as purely pragmatic or functional, you have no way of wanting to lean into that dysfunction or try and work your way through it. You just throw it away like we throw away anything else that's broken. Whereas if we see it as, as a symbolic and spiritual and transformational, a big story for our most intimate relationships, that will mean that we will lean into discomfort, lean into the difficulty, work through those problems, and we will begin to see health come because you have a higher view view of what is going on, playing dress ups. In the passage that we just read together from Ephesians 5, 21 to 33, there is a lot in there. There is a lot in there and a lot of it to us, particularly in our culture in 21st century West, might seem a little bit strange. But what we need to do is unpack some of this passage, unpack the scripture that's in there. And so what we're going to do is we're going to unpack it together. Then we're going to make some applications and then we're going to figure out what to do next. OK, Does that sound OK. So this is what we're going to do. Paul says here three things about marriage. 
three things particularly about what marriage relationships, the most intimate relationship, the most intimate human relationship that you can have on planet Earth right now. He says three things about it. He says, one, marriage is a metaphor. Two, marriage is a ministry. And three, marriage is a mystery. Let's say those three again. One, marriage is a metaphor. Two, marriage is a ministry. And three, marriage is a mystery. Now, those of you who've been married for a while are saying yes and amen to that third one. It's a mystery. We're still trying to figure it out. You're living with an alien in your house and you don't know how to deal with it. We're going to get there. Absolutely. But firstly, he says that marriage is a metaphor. What does that mean? It means this, that husbands and wives in marriage dress up to play the role of something bigger, something greater. He says, husbands, love your wife as Christ loves the church. He says, wives, honour and respect and respond to that love as the church responds and respects and honours Christ. There is a metaphorical relationship going on. There is a bigger story. Your marriage is an echo of the original sound of Christ's love for his bride. Isn't that cool? That's exactly what he's saying here. It's a metaphor. So when we look at your marriage, what we're looking at is a drama. We're looking at a drama on a stage and we're looking at your marriage to see how Christ loves his church. We're looking on a stage and we're seeing the way that the the bride of Christ responds to the overtures of his love. He esteems her higher than himself. Now you might think, oh, there's there's a power imbalance here. What, the husband gets to play the role of, of Christ and the church gets to only play, I mean, the wife gets to play the role of the church? That doesn't sound right. There might sound like an, a power imbalance to you. But I'll tell you what, if it feels like there's a power imbalance, then I reckon you've got to change your ecclesiology. You've got to get a better and a bigger view of what the church is because Jesus himself esteems the church. Jesus himself died for the church. Jesus himself laid his life down, preferred her, lifted her up, honours her, lavishes gifts upon her, gives grace to her, esteems her, calls her his beloved. And so when we get to, when wives get to dress up as the church and get to dress up as the bride of Christ, that is a high and holy and noble calling, maybe even higher and holier and more noble than Christ himself in the husband. So when we dress up into this, we're playing a metaphor. Your marriage is more than just about you. Your marriage is more than just about two people trying to work it out. Your marriage is more than that. It's telling a story. It's the sound of the train that's, that you, you hear in the tunnel before the train arrives. It's the, it's the sound of the waves that you can hear when you're a little bit far from the beach and then you move closer and you get to see the real thing. Marriage is the sound of God's love for his church that we hear right now before we see it in action. Marriage is a metaphor. Secondly, marriage is a ministry. It's a ministry because it is a relationship of service. Did you see that there in the passage? It said that that, uh, the husband should lay himself down and prefer his wife, serve her in the word, serve her in love. And likewise, the wife respects and responds to her husband's love in the same way. There is a holy ministry that happens in the home, a ministry of service and preferential treatment for the other that you do not get anywhere else in the world. It's different to the relationship that you have with your kids or to your parents. It's different to the relationship that you have with your friends. And I want to say this, and maybe this, I don't mean this to uh, offend anybody, but you do not marry your best friend. You don't marry your best friend because it's easy to live with people that are like you. But when you get married, you live with somebody, you share a bed with somebody who is equal in value, but different in nature. 
equal in value, but different in gender. That is a true miracle. That's what you could add a fourth one in there. If, if marriage is a, a metaphor and a, and a mystery and a ministry, it's also a miracle because you're living every day with somebody who's so different to you are. It, it's not as hard. It's not rocket science to live with someone who's the same as you. Your marriage partner, your spouse is not your best friend. Your best friend are people around you who tell you who to marry. Your best friends are the people who, who Ben talked about a couple of weeks ago who tell you when you're being a good husband or you're being a good wife or you're not being a good husband or you're not being a good wife. They're the people who are around you, this, this uh, cloud of witnesses in real life and real form who are encouraging you, who are calling you to something higher. When you, when, and I get it, you know, you so, see the social media posts. Today I got to marry my best friend. Five years married to my best friend. That's all awesome and I get the sentence but they're two distinct roles. You see, Jody's not my best friend. She's my wife. She's something better than a friend. She's something greater than a friend. She's my spouse. She's my life mate. She's my partner in crime. She's my teammate. We're the ones who are doing life together. We're intimate together. And that is something so different to being having spiritual friends. And I Respect that, I honour that, I celebrate that because marriage is a ministry when you serve somebody and you, you seek to, to prefer somebody who is so different to you. Different in nature, different in gender, but same in value. Marriage is a ministry. It's a ministry. And then thirdly, marriage is a mystery. That's what Paul says here. He says, you know, the, the um, uh, husband should um, leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. And he says, this is a mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Marriage is a mystery. There are still things that we're trying to figure out about it. How, you, I can't tell you how you can live with somebody. Jody and I are coming up to nearly 20 years in marriage this year in January. And I can't tell you why I love her more now than I did at the beginning when we first got married. I can't tell you why love or how love grows over time. I can't tell you how when I seek to prefer her and when I seek to put myself lower than her and lift her up, how hum somehow that blesses me. I can't tell you how it happens. It's a mystery, but it's true. It's true, and so when we enter into that mystery, it means that our marriages can be filled with just that little bit of magic. You know, just that little bit of magic. And it's not that sugar candy high of like lust and romance that happens when people have like been together for two weeks. It's not that. It's something that grows over time, that gets stronger. It gets more, it gets more defined. It gets more definite. It gets deeper. It gets more rich. It gets more joyful. And so those who've been married for 40, 50, 60 years, you guys are my heroes because you've learned the art of living in mystery for a very, very, long time. It's like when you're married together in this mystery, there is such a concrete love, such a concrete connection that over time, what happens is it bubbles up and spills out into children and into grandchildren and into legacy and into future and into history that a generational line will be blessed because you lived inside of this mystery of marriage. I hope you're feeling this today. I hope you're getting this today because this is so, so important for us as we live inside of the bigger story. God has a bigger story for you and a bigger story for me. Now that might make you ask, when we talk all about marriage, and we think all about these things as a metaphor, as ministry and as a mystery. What about single people? What about singleness? What about maybe even the Bible ventures to call this somewhat controversially the gift of singleness? The gift of it. Well, let's have a look at 1 Corinthians 7 because I want to read some passages to you out of 1 Corinthians 7. Listen to what Paul says to the Corinthians. He says, um, now, as a concession, not as a command, I say this. I wish that all were as I myself am. Paul was a single man. He was single when he wrote, at, the t at the time of writing of this. I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one kind of gift, um, one of one kind and one of the other. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it's good for them to remain single as I am. And then he goes on to say this. But if you do marry, you've not sinned. 
And if a betrothed woman marries, she's not sinned, yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I want to spare you that. <laughs> Real talk from Paul. Those who marry will have, who will, have, will have troubles. Amen and amen. He says in verse 32, I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and listen to this, to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. Wow, he's got a lot to say to people who are single. He's got a lot to say to, to it there because the Bible actually calls it a gift. He says, I wish everyone could stay as I am, unmarried and single. But some people have one gift and other people have another, saying he's got a gift of being single. Now, what does that mean? What we usually think about when we think about that is, oh yeah, great, I'm, I'm single against my will and I do not want to be here. But when we think about every other gift in the Bible, Gifts of prophecy, gifts of knowledge, gifts of healing, gifts of wisdom. Who are the gifts for? For others, right? I have a gift of healing, maybe so that I can heal somebody else. I have a gift of prophecy so that somebody else is blessed. I have a, a, a gift of wisdom so that somebody else may be instructed in the Lord. The gift of singleness is exactly the same, my friends. Your gift is not for you. Your singleness is not for you. Your singleness is for the building up of the body, just like every other gift. He says here that if you're married, your interests are divided. You're thinking about your husband and you're thinking about the Lord. You're thinking about your wife and you're thinking about the Lord. When he says when you're single, you are free to please the Lord 100% of the time and your interests are not divided. You are unhinged from that. And so you get to live in the mystery without a filter. You know, there's a, a, there's a form of combat fighting called the UFC and the original um, byline or slogan when they first came out was as real as it gets. The idea was that without the rules and without all of the, the conventions, you got to see two people in the cage fighting and it was as real as it gets. Being single before the Lord is as real as it gets because it's life lived as the bride before the bridegroom without a filter, without the metaphor. It's life lived without the metaphor. It is as real as it gets when we see you living your life, single person before the Lord in undivided devotion. It blesses us us. The church has done a bad job of celebrating singleness. We've done a really bad job and I just want to repent of that because what we see in scripture is that singleness is a gift from God for the building up of the body. It's a building up of others. We can see what it's like, the glory and the beauty and the honour and the love of a person living their life before Jesus in undivided devotion without having to think about all those other things. And he says, I want you to be free from those anxieties. It's a gift to the church. You are a loving gift because we get to see the God life in you. We get to see the God life in you without a filter, without other anxieties, without being hinged to other things. And we get to see what that looks like, be encouraged by that, be lifted up by that, be honored and blessed by that. That is why your singleness is a gift and we celebrate you, we honour you, we love you, and we want you to grow and thrive. You might be single for a time, you might be divorced, you might be called to a life of singleness. I know a few people, I've been blessed by a few people in my own life. Dorothy Oldfield, who, uh, who Jody talked about last week, was somebody blessed with a gift of singleness that blessed me because she lived her life in undivided devotion to Jesus. So, whether you're married or you're single, today it's time to dress up. It's time to put on the cape. It's time to put on the clothes like you would dress up to go to a special event. It's not like you're putting something on that doesn't exist when you dress up. We begin to see what was really there all along. It's not make-believe. It's not as though you're putting something on to pretend. No, you're putting something on so that we begin to see what has been there all along. 
We begin to see what the glory was that was bubbling up underneath you. When you dress up into it, we get to see it and we get to see the bigger story that we find ourselves in. Husbands, love your wives. Honour her, esteem her, lift her up, show kindness, grace and mercy to her. Do not be harsh with her. If, if you're harsh with her, you must think that Jesus is harsh with you. He's not harsh with you. He's not harsh with his church. And so don't be harsh with her. Love her, esteem her, lay yourself down for her, serve her, do those things that she loves because you will win her heart. Now wives, respond to that love. Respond to that love in patience. Respond to that love in kindness. Invite him into the mystery that is you. Invite him into that mystery of your life. Invite him into your world. Invite him into those spaces. Love on him. Honour him. Call out the best in him. Respect him so that he will go to new levels in faith, new levels in his relationship with God. And now those who are single, we want to see you live out your life in undivided devotion to Jesus. We want to be inspired as you lean into Christ, as you lean into him and we get to see you live out your life as the bride. Whether you're a man or a woman, you get to, you get to be the bride. You know, I think females have the uh, upper hand here because they often get to be the bride twice, once in real life and then once in eternal life. And so when you get to lean in as the bride, we see the glory of a person like Enoch walking with God. We see the glory of, and that, that encourages us, that inspires us in your undivided devotion. It's time to dress up. You know, one of the biggest questions when we have a, a marriage talk, or you talk about marriage, particularly in church, is the question around why Jesus was never married. You know, it's one of the questions that kids always ask. Why wasn't Jesus ever married? And, you know, you get some of those kind of the false gospels that were written around about the same time as the gospels that we have in Scripture that claim that Jesus was married or that he had intimate relationships with women. But, you know, it's not true. The Bible clearly says that Jesus was not married. And we've got to ask the question, why? If marriage is normative and normal for a, for a person and we want to be able to tell that story, why was Jesus not married? Well, the answer is this. Jesus, during his time on life, uh, in life, Jesus, during his time on earth, rather, was waiting for his bride. He was waiting for her to make herself ready. He was wooing her. He was calling her in love. He was showing her his strength. He was showing her his kindness. And then when Jesus arrived at the cross, he did not bow a knee, but the foot of the cross went hard into the dirt. He stretched out his arms to show the greatest wedding proposal that the world will ever see. As he opened up his arms and said, I am here for you. I want to be here for you forever. I'm going to love you. I'm going to care for you. I want to make you my bride. And we're going to go and live in the place that my father has prepared. The grand prince of the universe has come to claim his bride. And he does that on the cross. And when you and I respond, when we respond and say, yes, Jesus, I want to come. I want to be part of that feast. I want to be part of that life. I want to be included in that God life with you. You get a wedding invitation. And it's not just to be a guest. It's not just to be one of the onlookers who stand at the back. You get a wedding invitation because you now are the bride. And the book of Revelation says that when the wedding day comes, the bride will be dressed in fine white linen and, and that's the righteousness that's been given to her by Christ. And she stands and the wedding is complete and the two become one flesh. Now that is a mystery, but Paul's talking there about Christ and the church. So when we live into that, that's, you want to talk about dressing up. That's dressing up in the clothes that God has given you. And that's what I want to leave you with today. Dress up in the clothes that God has given you. Husbands, he's called you to be like Jesus in this place, in your marriage. Wives, he's called you to be like the church, to be radiant and glorious and loving and kind and gentle and strong and firm in that marriage as well. And single people, he's called you to lean into him in undivided 
unrequited devotion and we get to dress up with the clothes that we've been given as we all look forward to that final day. That day when the marriage is complete and the two become one and we live eternally with God forever. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have prepared a place for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've prepared prepared a place for us by the side of our bridegroom. When John the Baptist was on earth, God, he he said that now that the bridegroom has come, his ministry could decrease so that the ministry of the Son could increase. And we would say the same in our own lives, Jesus. May your ministry in our lives increase. And may our own desires, our own agenda decrease. May our will and our ego and our pride and ourselves decrease that we might see the glory of the Son, the one and only, the Son of of the one coming from the Father, full of grace and truth. May he be glorified and lifted up in our own lives as we dress up into those roles with the clothes that we've been given in the righteousness that's found in him, in Jesus' name. Amen.